Well, as you know, we just came from Milwaukee, and being that close, I just couldn't fly by Minnesota, particularly when I know our opponent's spending so much time in California. We're here to let the people of this great state know how much we care and that George Bush and I would be honored to have their vote on Tuesday. In the very beginning, we've been running a national campaign, taking our cause all over America. Everyone knows that we've never written off any state nor taken any state for granted. And even more important, we'll never take the voters for granted. When people enter the voting booth, that's the most private and protected moment of them all. I don't want this election to end without every American, and I sincerely mean all of them, knowing that we would like their support to continue the work that we're doing. Now, I've seen some of these poll results, just as you have. The last time I looked up at Mount Rushmore, I, I didn't see President Dewey's face there. <laughs> so today, once again, we want to urge our supporters to get out to the polls, to take their neighbors, to do all that's possible to see that our message gets to the people. And when they get to the polls, we would appreciate their support for the re-election of Minnesota's strong and effective Senator, Rudy Boschwitz. I need Rudy back in Washington again, as well as the two fine congressional candidates, Pat Truman and Keith Spicer. And Keith is here with us today. We need help to get tax rates down, even lower, not up. We need help to keep America strong and always prepared for peace. We need help to keep control over the growth of government so that we get back to the first principles in America. Here, the people are in charge. We need your help to get our initiatives passed into law, a balanced budget amendment, a line item veto, enterprise zones, and tuition tax credits. We need the help of every citizen to keep alive the fire of hope in America, to make opportunity our national watchword so that we'll go into the next decade and the next century a strong, prosperous, and united nation which will give the next generation the fullest of freedom in a world of peace. End of statement. Would the Gipper run up the score, Mr. President? What? Would the Gipper run up the score in the closing minutes? <laughs> uh, I don't think of it as running up the score. The Gipper would never quit before the final whistle. Mr. President, you said yesterday that you would not use tax reform in any way as a guise for tax increases. In these closing days of the campaign, would you flatly, absolutely rule out in a second term supporting the idea of taxing unemployment or workmen's compensation benefits? or changing the federal deductions for state and local taxes? I just have to tell you that I have seen some of these reports and rumors about what is being considered. I have seen no report as yet directly from those who are working on the idea of tax reform. I know that the instructions to them are we want a simplification, we want no increase in rates in the individual, if possible to broaden the tax base to get some of that hundred billion dollars that isn't presently being paid by people who owe it. And I'm going to wait until I have the package in front of me and what the recommendations are. But uh, again, as I say, the, one of the instructions is, this is not to become a guise for increasing taxes on the individuals you more than the president. If you're still holding out that possibility, then can you say, aside from what recommendations come to you, how you feel about the idea of taxing workers and unemployment compensation benefits or changing those federal deductions? I have no tax. idea that, that anything of that kind would be recommended uh, to me, and uh, I think that would have to uh, really uh, I'd have, to have to be proven to me that there, was, there was, that there was some excuse for doing such a thing. I don't believe that there is. I don't see, I don't see why the government should be giving people money 
and then go through the expensive process of taking some of it away from them again. Mr. President, Mr. President you have said, and you uh, said again yesterday, that you would not raise taxes or use the term over my dead body. Uh, but at the same time, you put you back off a little bit and say, well, I'm, not, I'm talking about tax rates, not taxes. It is still possible that people could no, not the people presently paying taxes having their taxes increased. If there would be any increase in government's revenues, it would be in the broadening of the base to where we would then be getting some of the money that, as I say, is presently not being paid to the government, and it's been estimated by many people that the amount is probably in the neighborhood of $100 billion of tax that is being avoided in the United States. Now, those people who are honestly paying their taxes uh, should not be penalized for that. And if there is a way that we can get some of that money that's not being paid, we're going to try to do it. Mr. President, yeah. today is the uh, day for elections in uh, Nicaragua. Can you flatly rule out, if you're reelected, any kind of military intervention in Central America and Nicaragua? I've said many times, Bill, that the there is no intention on our part whatsoever of troops uh, going into Latin America any place or any military help of that kind, nor has it been asked by anyone in Latin America. As a matter of fact, I think they would be very much opposed to it. They've expressed that feeling to us. But on the other hand, on the other hand, should, should a president ever be in the position of perhaps encouraging more aggression down there? Uh, by making such a statement. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that we have no plans whatsoever or any desire to put forces into Latin America. What about increased aid, sir, for El Salvador and uh, for the Congress in Nicaragua? This would be in the manner of helping them as we have been helping in the, in the past. And uh, we've proposed a plan or had a plan proposed that we've ex adopted, and that is the plan from the bipartisan Kissinger have chaired commission that uh, calls for over a five-year a five-year program of economic and social aid for about three-fourths of the amount and about one-fourth to help them with their security by providing arms training and so forth and we think that plan is what we want to follow what about the conference you're going to continue right. to seek funding for them yes because uh, the Sandinista government is still supporting the uh, guerrillas that are fighting against the duly elected government of El Salvador. Mr. President, you never fully explained the joke you made last summer about bombing the Soviets. What prompted you to say something like that? Well, I'm glad you asked that, because no one's ever bothered to ask. I was sitting in a room, granted, I should have been aware that um, uh, there are no secrets. I was sitting in a small room, ready to do my radio broadcast, with a few of my own people around me, and actually I meant it as a kind of a satirical charm, blast against those who were trying to paint me as a warmonger. So having to do a sound check, I simply said that uh, for the sound man's benefit. Uh, I didn't know until later that a line had been opened because uh, one of you here had complained, uh, one of the TV networks or radio networks had complained that uh, their line uh, to the location uh, was giving them some trouble. Uh, I have to say that whatever my sin was in making a, a joke of that kind, even though it was intended in private for only a few people, I don't think that was any greater sin than the media then broadcasting it worldwide in such a way that it could create an incident. Were you so concerned about the uh, Russians losing 20 million people during World War II? Do you feel in retrospect that it was insensitive to, to make a joke like that? It wasn't, whether, whether it was right or wrong to make it, it was made in the privacy of a room and a few people close to me that I believed uh, it would not go any further, and it was just in the spur of the moment I had to say something, and you get tired sometimes of counting to 10 as a voice check and so forth. But, all right, I shouldn't have said it, but I will further emphasize the media also shares in a responsibility for our national security, and I don't think they should have spread it. They weren't intended to hear it. Who was here? Helen, yeah. 
specific on anything you're going to do after the election. I speak of taxes, I speak of possible adventurism abroad if you have a mandate. Also, you said uh, that you don't want to write off any part of the electorate, but the blacks will not vote for you because they think that you have not been fair. And they think that because they do not know, nor have they been told, nor have we been able to get the message to them of how much has been done. And I will charge right now that no administration previous to ours has done as much, has filed as many criminal charges for violation of the civil rights law, uh, has done as much uh, with regard to the, uh, the helping of the historic black colleges and universities. So. Uh, I could go on with more things that we've done, as a matter of fact, uh, in our present Employment Training Act. Um, that is aimed, enterprise zones would be aimed very predominantly in a number of areas in the country at those people. The small business support, the fact that we have directed government contractors to use minority-owned uh, firms, and that goes in the military too, in the subcontractors and defense. And they've, we've vastly increased anything that has ever been done in the stimulation and development of minority-owned businesses. Uh, you said that we time for, for one more. It might be uh, good to take it from the local press. Uh, so the yes, you know something. Mr. President, just one question uh, on that, a follow-up on that. You said that many times before yeah. about the black situation. Yet, in all of your campaign appearances, there are hardly ever any black people in your audiences. Why haven't you encouraged more appearances in black areas of the country to invite black people out to hear personally from you? Well, in the areas where we've been and in the cities uh, uh, that we've campaigned in, there's no block to anyone being present, but doesn't it indicate that just what I've said, we're well aware that the overwhelming majority have been misled as to what our, rep our administration represents with regard to their interests. But we also know that all of those who do know of what we've done are highly supportive of us and are doing a lot to uh, help try to get the message uh, to uh, the rest of the minority groups. But I will match our record against, as I've said, that of any other administration. But listen, I think that what's just been suggested to me here is right. You, you people have at me other times. Where is a chance for, no, for the local press? What? Good. That, what is my reaction to the? Well, I'm quite sure that uh, you know this isn't going to be a <laughs> a scoreless game on the other side, and of course the supporters are coming out, and I would expect them to do that. And I'm not paying any attention to the polls. That's why I'm still campaigning right down to the wire as hard as I can. Mr. President, uh, I uh, uh, understand that you haven't had a press conference since July. This would be one of the few that I understand that you've held. Is there a reason for that? Well, let me just say something else that no one's paid any attention to. If you add up the total time that I have done with regard to the press corps, standing under the airplane wing out there, meetings of that kind, that total time since Labor Day would amount to about six regular 30-minute press conferences. So the fact that we haven't called it a formal press conference and done it in the East Room of the White House, I think that uh, that sort of belies the fact that I'm uh, uh, in a cocoon and that I am not available to the media. Do you agree but, with Vice President Bush that your opponents are idiots for not agreeing with you? Um, I was just going to cut this off, and I should have before that last question. <laughs> no, I, I understand that he was referring to some hecklers in the crowd, and uh, all I know is that uh, the vice president has been doing a yeoman job throughout the country in his campaigning, and I'm deeply indebted to him. And uh, I, I believe him when he says that he was referring to hecklers in the crowd. And sometimes you do get a little impatient with some of them. But, uh, it isn't cynicism. I just, I just wasn't going to forego the chance here. I, 
Uh, I haven't intervened much in the logistics. I have left it to those people who are planning campaigns as to where we go, and we can't go every place. But as I say, we weren't going to miss this opportunity when we were this close. But now I've got to get going because there's a lot of people down in St. Louis waiting. What? What? What's this? Oh, I didn't want to offend him. You know, I feel discriminated against because people are talking here about black. And there are Emilio and a half black Hispanic like me that have been chosen to show the support in your police policy in Latin America. And then people say that you have no response support of the black. What about the black naturalized America from Cuba, from Santo Domingo, from all Latin America? Who are people who like uh, uh, others? and new values, you know, and so for your audience. Are they counted or not? They sure count with me. I'm glad that you made the statement uh, here, and I hope that everyone uh, recognized what you've just said. What Thank you. Question? God bless you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. It's a little bit mixed emotions. There's a certain amount of nostalgia with it, but uh, it's... Um, Sort of like you felt in, uh, coming up to your last football game of the season to know you weren't going to play football anymore. Farming is a big issue, obviously, here. What would another four years mean to farmers in southern Minnesota? I think that it would mean a great deal to the farmers because I'm well aware of what their problems have been and the problems they're suffering right now. Those problems were the result of 21.5% interest rates, of double-digit inflation for two years in a row, and of a very ill-advised grain embargo. And the, I don't think enough has been done in the past with regard to trade in, in other commodities. We have been working throughout the world now to stimulate markets. We canceled the grain embargo, as you know, and certainly inflation has come down and interest rates in both must come down farther. But all of this is aimed at helping. We're trying to develop world markets for our farm products and the fact uh, that we sold 23 million bushels or metric tons I should say not bushels metric tons to the Soviet Union alone last year and have uh, extended this to can make another 10 million available uh, right now for them we've been dealing with uh, Southeast Asia and with uh, our trading partners Japan I estimate that the sale of American beef to Japan will probably double over the next four years as a result of things we've worked out with them already. I think that the farmers should take a look at where they were under the previous administration and how little was done for them and how much was done to them and decide that maybe we're embarked on a different course. What? The only thing that I could ever see of the use of a grain embargo would be if this country were imposing a total boycott of everything in which everybody in the country would participate. But to pick the farmers out as they did as the only people who were then uh, going to participate in a boycott, that was decidedly unfair and it was shooting ourselves in the foot. Thank you. Thank you.